All right, very good. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm never sure if these mics work real well or not or whatever. Um, I like how the front here is kind of empty. I actually do have a shiny badge. I'm a federal officer, um, and that must have scared folks. Back to the back of the room. Um, I'm Paul Shalou. I work for USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. We're one of the USDA's regulatory agencies. Anyone here happen to know what the largest agency in the USDA is? Forest Service, by far, with 60,000 or so employees. Um, so we're small. As an agency, we're charged with protecting America's crops and natural resources and livestock um, while they're alive, as opposed to the Food Safety Inspection Service, which makes sure that when it gets turned into food, it's safe for you to eat. So we're protecting the health of the crop and the livestock, the herds out there. Um, so I work at agency headquarters just inside the DC Beltway. And my contact information is up there in case you're interested in it. A lot of folks ask me if I have a business card. I actually stopped carrying cards several years ago when I realized my contact information is at the bottom of our agency's Emerald Ashbore and Gypsy Moth web pages. And you can lose a business card really easily. But if you just remember, I'm the National Program Manager for the Emerald Ashbourne Gypsy Moth programs. Go to our agency's website, find those pages, scroll down, boom. You know how to get a hold of me. OK, so what's the problem? Why are we, as a regulatory agency, involved with firewood? And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, or at least singing a song you've already heard. But there's this laundry list of regulated pests and, 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 and a number of other pests that we don't regulate that can be moved in or on firewood. And some of them are incredibly destructive. Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, gypsy moth, walnut twig beetle, which attacks the walnuts, um, on and on and on and on the, the list goes. Um, so it's important to do what we can to prevent the human-assisted movement of these pests, and that's where regulations come in, right? It's also one of the interesting things about working with the firewood industry is that there are commercial pathways for the movement of these pests, but there's also the private citizen component. When Sally Citizen decides she's gonna go camping with the Girl Scout troop, and she brings her firewood with her, well, we can put regulations on the books. Sally Citizen may or may not know the regs. She may or may not comply with them. We're certainly not going to be able to track her down and enforce those regulations. So there's a heavy outreach component to our, our forest pest programs as well. The other thing that's true about the firewood industry that I find fascinating is it's really, it's got a lot going on with it. Everything from the guy with a chainsaw and a pickup truck to guys like Jeff Friedman that are moving firewood literally nationally on a daily basis. Everything in between in terms of production systems, in terms of scale of production, scale of sales, all those things. So we have to work with all of that as a regulatory agency. So let's look at the regulatory landscape here for just a minute. What are our regulations um, regarding firewood? We treat it as what we call a regulated article under our pest-specific regulations. So we don't have a firewood regulation. What we have is an emerald ash borer regulation that, among other things, says firewood is one of the ways this can be moved. So therefore, we have restrictions on how and when and where it can be moved. It's a nuanced difference, but it's important. I'm going to be focusing on the federal regulations here. There are states that have commodity-based firewood regulations out there as well. Pennsylvania happens to be one of them, just north of here. New York, another one that uh, a lot of folks might be familiar with. Those tend to be commodity-based. They tend to say, we're regulating firewood because of all these pests, which is sort of turning the sock inside out from how we do it at the federal level, where we're saying there's this pest and we're re regulating firewood because firewood is one of the ways that that particular pest can be moved. 
We also have restrictions on importing firewood, wood products in general, into the country. In other words, moving it in international trade. It's probably not a big concern to you guys. I will share with you briefly on that, though. Just like we would never allow China to say, you have to take our product under these conditions. No, we're telling China, if you want to ship that product into the United States, here's the conditions you have to meet, right? Well, the same was true for our stuff going overseas. It's not up to us to tell the European Union what their requirements are. It's up to us or our producers to meet those requirements. Now, of course, all of that's negotiated at the international level. There's this thing called the International Plant Protection Convention. That's kind of the, the governing body for international trade um, around plant health issues. But just be aware that if you decide you're going to ship overseas, it's not the U.S. regulations you need to meet. It's the receiving countries' regs that you would need to meet. There are state regulations, as I mentioned. They're typically set up as external quarantines. They're uniformly set up as being commodity-based, again, going back to that, as opposed to pest-based, where firewood is a regulated article. Virtually every state that has one of these external firewood quarantines is calling for the 160 for 75 minute heat treatment. It's the most stringent heat treatment standard that we have. You've probably picked up by now if you've seen Jeff's talk and a couple of others. There are other heat treatment standards out there for the emerald ash borer quarantine. It's 140 for 60 minutes. For the gypsy moth quarantine, it's 56 uh, degrees Celsius, about 130 for 30 minutes. But the states are asking for 160 for 75. The good news is, if you get to 160 for 75, you surely hit the other heat treatment standards along the way, right? So just a short list of some of the states with those kinds of firewood regulations at the bottom there. So let's talk about some of these pests a little bit. And by the way, happy to take questions as we go here. Um, I'm, I'm just going to hit on, on the big the big pests in terms of, at the federal level, the ones we have regulations for. We'll look a little bit at the pest, and we'll look at what the quarantines look like for them. It's a xylem feeder. In other words, it feeds on the heartwood and the sapwood, as opposed to the phloem and the cambium. So it tunnels deep into the wood. So bark removal isn't going to work for this puppy. right? There are quarantine areas in Massachusetts, New York, and Ohio. Add it all together. Those quarantine areas total about 350 square miles. So by our standards, it's a keychain size kind of a quarantine. Fits neatly in your pocket. <clears throat> the treatment standard to move firewood out of an Asian longhorn beetle quarantine area is 160 for 75 minutes for firewood. And of course, you can visit our web page and you can see current quarantine maps. Yes, sir. A vacuum kiln, like a steam vacuum? No. Vacuum. No. Oh, yeah. no. Uh, but uh, that does lead to an interesting thing. I'll, I'll digress for just a second. You know, standard treat, heat treatment is dry heat, right? We are looking at and developing in concert with, with uh, a researcher down at University of Virginia and a couple of other folks, some of our internal researchers, for a long time, for those huge cotton bales that get moved overseas, they've used a combination of pulling a partial vacuum and the steam to sterilize that cotton. And that looks like it works really well for wood. And excitingly, you don't lose quality in veneer logs um, on that. So that may come on stream here sometime in the next few years, um, both domestically and perhaps for interna international trade. But just a straight vacuum. No, most of these insects are pretty tolerant of partial vacuums, actually. So just a quick look at those quarantine areas outlined in red on these maps. As I say, they total about 350 square miles. ALB is a pretty slow spreader. It can fly. It's a strong flyer when they decide to, but they're really lazy. They don't like to fly. So its natural rate of spread is very, very limited. 
The infestation rate in a given log is also quite low, so the odds of it moving on firewood is uh, quite a bit less than, say, emerald ash borer. You might, in a two-foot bolt, have one, maybe two ALB larvae, and that same bolt, if it was infested with emerald ash borer, upwards of 100, maybe even 1,000, um, just to give you. So the odds of starting a new population elsewhere because of the movement of wood is greatly less, which is why we have these pocket-sized quarantines, is we can contain the insect, we can eradicate it. Yes, sir? Are you dealing with any similar situations in Asia from anything from us? Oh, yeah, we give as good as we get. <laughs> well, I wish none of it was happening. I wish none of it was happening, but it is a global economy anymore. But yeah, the, the reality is we give as good as we got. And, oh, um, we, we've given them a couple of really devastating wood borers and a few fungal diseases. And so, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, EAB, I mentioned I'm the National Program Manager for this puppy. So it's been an interesting ride for the last 10 years or so. It's a phloem feeder. It feeds, uh, y you know, right under the bark on the phloem layer. It's really rich in sugars, photosynthates, which is one reason why it's there. Um, it's feeding activity, it's larval feeding activity, um, girdles the tree, causes death. You guys probably know enough about this that I don't need to dwell on that part of it. We have quarantine areas in 25 states. About half of those states are, are under statewide quarantine. Maryland happens to be one of them. Pennsylvania is another. West Virginia is another. Virginia is another state under statewide quarantine. So right here, since movement within a quarantine area is unregulated, it's only when you exit the quarantine Right here, if you're working on a fairly small and local scale with your firewood, you're probably not too worried about the federal quarantines, because you're probably not moving outside the federal quarantine. But you do have to be mindful of the state quarantines. And I'll, I'll give you a hint on how to try and figure those out a little bit um, towards the end here. Treatments are 60 degrees Celsius or 140 Fahrenheit. I usually think in Celsius with these treatments because that's the international standard. So 140 for 60 minutes. You can also debark the wood along with the removal of the outer half inch of sapwood. Most of the time emerald ash borer when it forms its pupil chamber, it'll turn out into the bark to form its pupil chamber. But sometimes they turn inward and form their pupil chamber in the, in the outer sapwood. Um, so that's why we require the movement removal of that outer half inch of sapwood. You can fumigate it with methyl bromide. Anyone here up for fumigating with methyl bromide? Never talked to a firewood producer yet that's been interested in fumigating. They've been interested in how it's done, but they certainly haven't been inter interested in adopting it as a business practice. And finally, we allow kiln sterilization, which I've always found a bit funny. Um, and the reason I say that is what we regulate is green ash wood. And I don't mean the species green ash, I mean green wood, right? Well, this is a drying schedule. So by the time you dry it to schedule requirements, which is down around 12, 15%, it's no longer a regulated article. So uh, I've always found this one just a bit funny, but you can do it. And we have some pallet manufacturers that actually follow that schedule and, and a couple of lumber manufacturers. So again, Go to APHIS's EAB webpage for our quarantines, but I will show you what is famously known as the red dot map. Each red dot represents the initial detection in a given county. The quarantine areas are outlined, federal quarantine areas in blue. As I say, many states are entirely under federal quarantine. Some states have partial state quarantines. Minnesota and Wisconsin, Missouri, Arkansas, well, Missouri entirely, but Arkansas and Louisiana, Georgia has a partial state quarantine. <laughs> we haven't found it there yet, believe it or not, and not for lack of looking, not for lack of looking. We'll find it there someday, but thus far we haven't found it there. Yeah, that's, that's a bit anomalous. 
Rhode Island also is a little kind of kind of weird, eh? Yes, sir. I noticed that West Virginia was testing for it probably three years before Maryland. How, how was it so far inland, or were they just ahead of the game? Well, actually, the, you know, we found Emerald Ashbore in Maryland back in 2003. EAV was first found in the United States in 2002, although we now know it was introduced probably in the early 90s, um, 10, 15 years prior to its detection. But there was a movement of infested nursery stock against the regulations out of this part of Michigan down to Prince George's County, Maryland. And so Maryland actually came on stream in 2003. West Virginia, the first detection was in late 2007. So, you know, it depends on how you want to count chickens. Um, on, on well, they were hanging traps in places that were more visible in West Virginia is probably a better way to put it. Um, we really didn't start using those purple traps um, for our, our national survey for Emerald Ashbore until 2008. I don't want to get bogged down in program history here. So they really kind of showed up everywhere all at once, like mushrooms in the landscape after a good spring rain, right? Um, those first through, through 2012, we were hanging 60,000 traps a year nationally. That sounds like a lot. But between us and the Forest Service, to give you an idea, for gypsy, our gypsy moss survey, there's a total of about 200,000 traps that go out. Um, but anyway, yeah, they just kind of exploded onto the landscape. Those purple traps turned out to be one of our best outreach tools ever, <laughs> ever, because they're so eye-catching, you know. Mm -hmm. Folks call them the Barney trap and all kinds of stuff. So that's the quarantine, as I say. <clears throat> It changes pretty rapidly. Unlike the ALB quarantine and the gypsy moth quarantine where we add a county here, a few square miles there, depending on which one from time to time, I'm adding counties to the EAV quarantine regularly, certainly on a monthly basis and sometimes more often than that during the survey season. So keep your eye on this map. The other thing that's true with Emerald Ash Borer, you see these red dots, like I mentioned? And I'm, I'm just going to mention this. Those are the counties that we've found emerald ash borer in. Within the quarantine area, you see a lot of counties with no red dot, don't you? So a lot of states proactively quarantine extra area, sometimes going statewide, even though they haven't found it in those counties. Sometimes that's because of known movement patterns of regulated articles. Sometimes you get donut holes, and it just makes sense to plug the hole, those kinds of things. So. So do keep an eye on this map. It does change pretty regularly if you're concerned about it. Gypsy moth, everyone is familiar with, with gypsy moth, at least in name, right? Was introduced back in 1860 or so uh, up in the Boston area. The real damage is done by the caterpillar's foliage feeding. Um, multiple years of, of defoliation will, will stress the tree enough. Gypsy moth actually rarely kills a tree in and of itself. It predisposes it to things like armillaria root rot, and that's what actually takes the trees out. But it's a good predisposer for sure. We see widespread mortality in outbreak years. We do see a boom and bust population cycle with the pest. So you go 10 years with no damage whatsoever and only seeing the occasional caterpillar or moth, and then all of a sudden it's raining frass, literally raining frass, and the trees are stripped in two or three weeks during the feeding season. And then you go back to after two or three years of that, they kind of fade into the background. We have quarantine areas. Actually, there should be 20 here. I apologize. I haven't updated it. We added two counties in Minnesota to the quarantine area about a year or so ago now. So we have quarantine areas in 20 states. Allowed treatments are 56 for 30, deep arcing. And since this one is really on the, on the surface, and the real concern with gypsy moth is movement of egg masses, um, in certain instances, and this is not for firewood, but like for saw and pulp logs, there are inspection protocols that will allow for movement out of the quarantine area as well. Again, we have a web page with a current quarantine map, but that's what it looks like right now. The two counties in Minnesota are up here that we just added. Those are the most recent two. I think West Virginia is getting ready to add another county down in this area. Uh, in the not too distant future. Again, this, this quarantine area changes relatively slowly. 
All right, who here has heard of Thousand Cankers Disease? Yeah, okay, good, 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 good. We don't have federal regulations for TCD. A number of states have state-level quarantines for Thousand Cankers Disease. It's a complex that involves a, a bark beetle. The bark beetle is literally about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. The beetles have specialized pouches called mycangia um, as part of their mouth parts, basically, where they deliberately store and transport f um, a wide variety of fungi. In this case, it's a particular fungus. Um, the beetle larvae don't actually feed on the wood. They do tunnel in the wood. They don't feed on the wood. What they're feeding on is the fungus. So they grow these fungus gardens in their, their galleries under the bark. That's, so that's why they deliberately carry it around with them, to inoculate that food source into the wood. But it causes a whole bunch of tiny little lesions, about quarter size. Those eventually cut off, again, the phloem tissues and girdle the tree and cause tree mortality. Out here, um, it's prevalent up and down the front range of the Rockies. Walnut, black walnut in particular, is not native to the front range. Um, a lot of folks don't realize the settlers brought walnut with them as they moved west. Anyone know why? Obvious answer would be the food crop, right? Wrong. Walnut trees are natural lightning rods. You go to any farmhouse that's 100 years old out in the Midwest and look 150 feet behind the house, there's either the stump of an old walnut or maybe that old walnut or progeny still there. That's why they brought them west. Along the front range, the dynamic was a little different. There's only a few types of trees that will grow there. It's so dry, 15 inches of rain a year. And so this is one of them that will actually do it. But uh, out east here, we know it's uh, in Ohio, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Virginia. Um, again, we don't have a federal quarantine. A lot of states do have external quarantines um, for thousand cankers disease. We don't have any approved treatments for firewood at this time. Um, we we're working on them. We think that the 60 for 60 treatment will work. In other words, 140 degrees for 60 minutes. But um, that's not been you know, finalized and put on the books. So that's what uh, the quarantines look like. Red states have exterior quarantines. In other words, you can't bring walnut in, <clears throat> including walnut firewood. And walnut is a beautiful firewood, but it's probably not the highest end use for most walnut. Um, and then there are some states in blue that have both internal and external quarantines. In other words, they have restrictions on within state movement and also restrictions on movement into the state. Okay, so I promised to tell you guys how to figure out what state has what going in the way of these state level quarantines. If you go to don'tmovefirewood.org, it's a website that is run basically by the Nature Conservancy. Um, we actually fund um, a significant portion of, of maintaining this website and the Don't Move Firewood campaign. Um, but if you dig around a little bit on the Don't Move Firewood um, website, and it's don'tmovefirewood.org, you'll find this firewood matrix. And you can see the states across the top, and then you, you know what they have quarantines for um, on, on the side there. Really, really handy because the state landscape, state regulation landscape, changes a lot, um, quite honestly. And so if you're thinking about moving firewood interstate, I would check this. Lee Greenwood with the Nature Conservancy works really, really hard to keep this as up to date as possible, but it's not gospel. And it's not an official regulatory publication, it's just a guide. So the other thing I would tell you if you're thinking about moving firewood interstate, our agency has what we call a state plant health director in each state. And if you go to our website and click on plant pests and diseases, you'll find a link that says report a pest. And click on that, and you'll find the contact information for our state plant health director in any given state. Each state has what we call a state plant regulatory official. It's the senior official in that state for plant health regulatory issues. 
they have a national organization called the National Plant Board. So if you go to nationalplantboard.org, there's a link at the top that says membership or members. I can't ever remember which it is. Click on that. You'll get a map of the country and a list of states. Either click on the state in the map or in the list, and you'll get the, uh, we, we usually call them spuds and spros, state plant health directors and state plant regulatory officials. So you'll get the contact information for the SPRO for that state. Please make that phone call. They'll give you the most up-to-date information on what it takes to move firewood in that state, within that state, whatever it is. They're, they're a great source of information about what the states are requiring um, for firewood movement. Okay, so just a few things that we ask you guys to do. Know what pests are in your area. I gave you a brief overview, but do a little bit more homework. Um, I think we're going to be sharing these presentations, right? So the maps that I showed now are current as of, say, a couple of weeks ago when I updated this presentation the last time. But those quarantine areas do change and so on. So know, know what pests are in your area. Keep an eye on that ball for us, please. When you're out working in the woods, keep your eyes open. If you see a pest report, remember I told you how to do the report of pest thing? If, if, especially if you think it's not one that we know of in an area. I'm not really going to be excited to hear from anyone about emerald ash borer here in Western Maryland. We know it's here. We know it's all over the place here, right? But if you call me up from Idaho and tell me you found emerald ash borer, I'm going to be running down the hall with my hair on fire, getting things going to take care of the problem, right? looking into it, making sure that it either is or isn't a real report, that kind of thing. Not that, not that we don't want folks calling in when I say real report. What I'm really saying there is we're going to go out, send a crew out, try and see if they can collect specimens, get them identified. There are legal processes to identifying these regulatory pests and confirming, yep, that's really it, so we really do need to regulate. And the reason that's so because these regulations, they create burdens and cost money for folks like you guys. And we don't want to impose those burdens for no reason. That would be, you know, not good. So keep your eyes open. If you see something, let us know about it. If you think that, you know, uh, it's in a place where we didn't know that pest was already. You find an Asian longhorn beetle anywhere in this part of the world that we want to know about. Don't confuse it for fine sawyer, but that we want to know about. Keep an eye on the federal and state regulations. That's been the thrust of my talk so far. Know what those are. Please obey them. They're there for a reason. I know, you know, I was talking uh, outside just a little bit ago with a couple of folks, and I was saying, you know, one of the challenges that we have as a regulatory agency in working with the forest products industry, we don't have these regulations because it's fun to have regulations. We have these regulations because we're trying to protect somebody's base resource, right? And one of the challenges we have with the forest products industry, when you think of it writ large, is that there's a high substitution factor between different types of wood for different uses, as opposed to, say, the orange crop. And I'm getting famous for this question, but what do you make orange juice from? Oranges, right? Can you make orange juice from anything else? No, if you made it from apples, it'd be apple juice, right? So the citrus industry has a very high level of interest and is up on Capitol Hill and so on, lobbying all the time about the pests they're concerned about and making sure that those programs are well-funded and well taken care of. It's been a bit of more of a challenge with the forest products industry because Okay, now we know what orange juice is made from. What do you make a two by four from? Spruce, pine, fir, hemlock, right? Any kind of spruce, any kind of pine, any kind of fir, any kind of hemlock. Although hemlock is a pretty fuzzy two by four, I'll tell you for sure. Right? Different example, I was touring the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory down in Louisville a couple of years ago, and someone in my group, wasn't me, I promise, Asked the tour guide, are you guys really worried about emerald ash borer? And the tour guide says, well, we get more money for our maple bats. <laughs> now, 
I want to put that in context. Louisville Slugger has been a great pro program partner for the EAB program for a long, long time. You go to their website. I haven't done this in a year or two, but for the longest time, and I assume it's still up there, they had links to our Emerald Ash Borer web page, emeraldashborer.info, and some information about it. So I don't want to paint the wrong picture about Louisville Slugger. But the comment is telling, isn't it, in terms of you know, the level of concern about damaging forest pests, especially exotic invasive pests in the forest product industry and why it's not at the same level as, say, the cotton industry. Maintain good business records, that's really key. That's really key for you as a businessman. So I don't need to sell you on this one. Slips of paper on your dashboard aren't going to get you into the big leagues, I promise. But for us as a regulatory agency, just like you need to keep all of your receipts and so on for your tax returns for multiple years so they can go back and figure out what happened if they audit you, if we come in and we're trying to do what we call a trace forward or a trace back, we had a problem, found a pest in some firewood somewhere, and we're going to try and figure out where that firewood came from and where it went to and all that good stuff, where other places it might have gone to, we're going to need these business records. So keep good records. If you don't have them, you're setting yourself up for failure in terms of fines and so on. So maintain good business records, who you bought your wood from, who you sold your firewood to. You know, we don't care about the prices on either side of that equation, but we do want to know where the wood came from and where it went to. And that would all be part of your business records. But as I say, you need that for business reasons anyway, don't you? Label your firewood with the place of harvest to the county level and the place of production. Just give us the city it's in. The stuff was made in Sharpsburg. We understand there are good, compelling business reasons not to put the exact address of your production facility on your label, starting with it takes up label space, which is incredibly valuable, and also going to things like competition and so on. But do label your firewood with place of origin and place of production. That really helps us, again, if we see a problem, figure out what we're working with. It also is pretty good for you in terms of just helping get the word out about who you are and what you're, where you're at. Question on that. Mm-hmm. How would you label poor wood? <laughs> You've heard of rubber stamps, right? <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Um, uh, there, uh, you know, that information should be on the bill of sale. Uh, you know, I, that, that would be the place I would put it. Or the equivalent of the bill of sale, your invoice, whatever it is that you use, right? You, you know, just the paperwork that goes along with the sale. <clears throat> A little less critical for cordwood. Nobody's moving cordwood like Jeff does across the country. Nobody's doing that that I know of. For very few people, I've never talked to anyone that's shipping cordwood across the country. It tends to move 50, maybe 100 miles, unless you're moving it into New York where they're willing to pay 700 bucks a cord, then it can move pretty long distances. And there we would want to see it on the bill of sale. That would be really helpful. But if you're selling it, you, you know, your place is here in Keatesville, and you're selling it up in Hagerstown, you know, that's probably not such a critical piece of information. We're going to, you know, if there's a problem there, we're going to ask the homeowner or wherever we find it, you know, where this would come from, and then we'll come visit you. <laughs> and, and then we'll talk about the rest of everything. So with, with bulk firewood, the, the game, so this is really mostly about, you know, the packaged firewood that we're talking about. And I think this kind of labeling, Jeff, that's part of AFPDA's certification program, right? That's correct. Yeah. So it's just, just good practice. The difference will be is instead of having, let's say if you have three yards you're shipping from, or if you have one yard you're bringing it to another spot to pack it. So for one instance, we have in Arizona, we get our yard from Coconino County, so we pack it all in Navajo County. So the label says uh, produced in Coconino County, packaged in Navajo County. But with the new labeling, what we would hope to have is one label that has the number on it. Any inspector, anybody anywhere can look and find that guy and know where it got packed. Yep. That would yep. be the big difference. So you'd have more consistency of labeling. Yep. 
Okay, this is a key thing. Get to know the people you work with. You, you know, our staff out in the field, the state plant regulatory officials, staff out in the field. You're not gonna see me at your facility probably. I do have my shiny badge and I could show up and I could write a violation and oh, by the way, federal fines for commercial violations can range up to $600,000 per violation. Not that we usually go that high, but could. If the damage is severe and the violation is egregious, could. Typical fines are in the thousands to ten thousands of dollars range, but that's still a big bite out of your profit if you end up with a violation, right? But get to know the regulatory personnel, our, our officers out in the field, the guy who comes out to visit your facility, enter into a compliance agreement with you, those kinds of things. Get to know them, get, make sure you know their contact information, establish a relationship with them. This is a people business, just like anything else, and knowing who you're working with helps an awful lot in making things work better, right? I've talked about our state plant health directors and I've talked about our state plant regulatory officials, so I won't go too far much further down that road. So with that, I'll thank you for listening to me and I'll listen to your questions and answer them as best as I can. Yes, sir. <coughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. E e e exactly right. Um, e you know, we allow ash logs to move out of the EAB quarantine zone to primary processing facilities, you know, sawmills, pulp mills. Um, during the winter months, those logs have to be processed before what we call adult flight season begins. In other words, onset of spring and the adults emerging from the wood and flying around. And any waste, you know, slab wood, bark, has to be properly disposed of, again, before adult flight season. Of course, adult flight season is shorter in the northern states and longer, starts earlier and ends later in the southernmost states. The very southernmost states, even though we haven't found EAB there yet, we figure EAB could emerge all year long from the research that we've done. So there is no adult flight season. So if you're a sawmill in Florida, you can't get ash logs out of the quarantine zone any time of the year. Um, but up here, uh, it's May 1st through October 30th, I believe. Um, so, great question. Other questions? Yes, sir. Are you concerned about stuff moving around inside the quarantine zone or just outside? That's, that's, that's a, a tremendous question. Um, that's the devil's choice with quarantines. And this is something that when a state is thinking about, you know, particularly going to a statewide quarantine, you know, we found Emerald Ashbourne in say half the counties and now they're thinking about, you know, sometimes we call it tossing in the towel, but going to a statewide quarantine. One of the things we always make sure that they have an awareness of, and, and again, it's kind of singing to the choir, the state plant regulatory officials are as aware of this stuff as we are, but you know, you gotta do due diligence. It's one of the things we always tell them is, you know, if you do that, you're facilitating the spread of the pest within that larger quarantine area. And we've seen that happen again and again and again. I don't know how far back I have to go. Uh, looking for EAB quarantine, there it is. All right, so. We found EAB, as I mentioned earlier, in West Virginia fall of 2007. October something, 2007, right? It's under statewide quarantine. Look at all of these red dots here, right? Pretty widespread across the entire state. West Virginia was one of the first states to go to a statewide quarantine. I believe it was back in 2010, maybe 2011. Compare that with Wisconsin. A little bit larger of a state, sure, I'll grant you that. And sure, they've done some proactive quarantining here and there. I'll grant you that as well. We found EAB for the first time in Wisconsin in the spring of 2008, just a few months later. And look how much le what less widespread it is within that state. I would argue that that statewide quarantine is part of why it's so widespread in West Virginia, not so widespread yet in Wisconsin. Minnesota is another great example. 
2009, so another year after that, really vigorous at the state level in, in enforcing their quarantine, really, really active with that. And look what they have going on. So the quarantines work. They absolutely work. Um, but once you go to a, a large area quarantine, within that quarantine area, it really does facilitate the, the smearing around of the test. I saw another hand. I'm sorry. I, I was going to comment on West Virginia. Just, just thinking about the, the location and the makeup of the forest industry in West Virginia, if you isolated any of those folks, you basically put them out of business. That's, that's exactly right. And, and this is – our agency's mission is – to protect the agricultural and natural resources of the na nation from these exotic invasive pests, right? But there's another piece to it. And Congress did this very deliberately when they created our agency. We're also charged with facilitating trade. Why did they do that? Because those are two opposite things, right? It would be really easy to protect the resource by just putting draconian regulations in place, right? Conversely, it'd be really easy to facilitate trade. Do none of this. Trade goes on with no burden whatsoever, at least from this end of things, right? They did that on purpose so that we're always trying to balance those two. And when a state makes a decision to go statewide, they're factoring in a number of different things, including impacts on, on the affected industry. Yeah, absolutely.